the very first topic there at the top, electronegativity, we talked about that the last time, which was Friday, or whenever we met last. Um, electronegativity, again, deals with the attraction for other atoms, electrons. And back in general, Kim, you were given a chart that had values on there, like for fluorine it was 4.0, and then for uh, oxygen it was 3.5, nitrogen was 3, carbon was 2.5, and, and so on and so forth. In AP Chem, you're not going to be given that table, but even better, you don't have to memorize that table. There are a few values that you should know, and those are the ones that I gave you for the fluorine. And it's real easy because it starts at fluorine with 4.0, and it goes down by one half as you go across the row. So four, three and a half, three, two and a half, two, and then hydrogen is 2.1. Those are probably the ones that you should have memorized in case they should ask you the difference in the electronegativities. Because when we, or when I ask you about, hey, what's the difference in the electronegativity, you're telling me what type of intramolecular force we have. Okay? Now, what's the difference between intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces? Intra is between. What's that? Okay, and here's an easy way to remember it. If you're looking at intra, ends with an A, that's between atoms. Okay, and inter is, well, there's no A in there, so that's between molecules. So intermolecular forces are between molecules or compounds, and intra are between atoms. Now, which of these two is stronger, do you think? The intra or inter? Intra. Much, much stronger. In other words, if I had a water molecule, and you're going to draw these Lewis structures here today, so you'll get excited. If I had a water molecule, and say I had another water molecule down here, okay, the forces between the water molecules are much, much weaker than the forces between the atoms. In other words, that's how I can get liquid water to go to gaseous water, because I just break that bond. If I break this bond right here, now I've just got water vapor. In other words, they're now in the gaseous phase. So we'll talk about these today. I don't think we'll talk about the enter. <coughs> yeah. All right. Covalent bonds, that's the first one that we're going to talk about. Covalent. When you hear the word covalent, I want you to think of one word. And what should that word be? Sharing. When you hear the word covalent, you think sharing. Now, there's equal sharing and there's unequal sharing. The equal sharing is between, and the nice thing is for AP Chem, you're not given that table of electronegativities. Equal sharing <coughs> takes place between the same kind of non-metal. Okay. So if I have hydrogen gas, okay, the bond between the hydrogen, that is a non-polar <coughs> covalent bond. If it's non-polar, that means we have equal sharing. Okay. If I have, say, oh, hydrochloric gas, okay, then I have two nonmetals and I have unequal sharing, and that is a polar covalent bond. Okay. So covalent means sharing, polar covalent means unequal sharing. In other words, one of these has a greater attraction for these shared electrons. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Both of these hydrogens have equal sharing of electrons because they're the same atom. <coughs> All right. And I just gave that definition. There by the hole punch in the middle there, ionic bonds. Actually, before I do that, looking on your periodic table, did I say this to you guys? That if you look on your periodic table... And you might want to make this note if you have the ability to. Because when we talk about covalent bonding or sharing of electrons, who does that take place between? What kind of elements? Metals and nonmetals? No. Nonmetal with nonmetal. 
So if you want to know, looking at your periodic table or make a note on this, where you see the carbon, your fluorine, and iodine on your periodic table. If you put a dot right smack dab in the middle of carbon, you put a dot right smack dab in the middle of fluorine, you put a dot right smack dab in the middle of iodine, and connect those dots, making a very straight line, not as straight as mine, you've just created the non-metal triangle. Those that are in the triangle and touching the, the, what are those, the legs of the triangle or sides of the triangle, these are the non-metals that we care about, that will be reacting. Over here are your noble gases. We're not going to be talking a lot about noble gases and forming compounds. These along here are your metalloids. We're not going to be doing a whole lot with those with covalent bonding. And then farther over to the left on your periodic table, those are all metals. So these are your non-metals that we care about for covalent bonding. And if they're the same, it's non polar covalent. If they're different, it's polar covalent, plain and simple. Okay. All right. That's just something that's probably real easy to remember. Now, you won't, again, on the test, you won't have the ability to write on that, but on your AP exam, you can put that on there. All right, ionic bonding. Ionic bonding. What is an ionic compound? Let's talk about that first. What's an ionic compound? What is an ionic compound? Yeah. <coughs> What's that? Okay, and where do, what, what makes up an ionic compound? Metal and a non-metal, very good. So, a good example, and we'll do, we'll do some electronic configurations for ionic compounds. A metal with a non-metal is an ionic bond. Now, back in general chem, we used to have you do the differences in electronegativities to determine if we had an ionic bond, a core, or I'm sorry, a nonpolar covalent bond, or a polar covalent bond. It's easy. If you see a metal, it's ionic, period. Okay? If you see a metal in your compound, it is an ionic bond. We're not going to put metals with metals. We don't do that in AP Chem. Okay? We'll talk about alloys, but we don't write compounds for that. So if you have, remember with the, the non-metal triangle, if there's nothing but that, you have covalent bonds. Then you have to decide, is it polar or non-polar? But if you have a metal, it's ionic. So you only have three types of um, bonds between atoms. Ionic, polar covalent, or non-polar covalent. Period. Don't make it hard. Dipole moments. Okay. A dipole moment is brought about when we have an unequal sharing of electrons. Okay, so like, uh, for example, we have water. We know that these electrons, actually let me write the electrons here. Okay, this is more of a short version. Now, answer me this. The electrons above and below the oxygen, are they being shared? No, so we don't need to worry about those. Those are oxygens, plain and simple. However, the electrons between the oxygen and the hydrogen are being shared. Now, which one of these is the hydrogen electron? Is it the top one or the bottom one? It doesn't matter. Don't get hung up on that. And I know there are some teachers that emphasize, well, that one's hydrogen, and that one's oxygen. Who cares? They're electrons. They're being shared, so it doesn't matter now. However, if we look at the values, okay, and this is what's nice. If you know the values, that's great. But if you look on the periodic table, who has the higher electronegative value? Hydrogen or oxygen? Oxygen. Why? Because on the periodic table, it's farther to the right. So that means that oxygen has a higher electronegative value, which means that these electrons that are being shared are closer to the oxygen than they are the hydrogen. Yeah, they're sharing, but it's not equal sharing. It's kind of like when you get married. Somebody's going to make more money than the other. I like that. That's fine. I, I don't mind if my wife makes more money than me. She teaches, but she doesn't. But the thing is, I like it when she brings in money. So I'm a hydrogen. She's the oxygen. Even though she has the greater attraction for these shared electrons, that's fine. Okay. So what that means is these two electrons are a little bit closer to the oxygen than the hydrogen, which means that the oxygen has a part, a part of a negative charge. It's called a partial charge. Because these two electrons are just a little closer to the oxygen than the hydrogen. 
since those electrons are a little bit closer to the oxygen, the hydrogen here has a part of a positive charge. Okay, These are called dipole moments. If I look at, say, sodium chloride, what has sodium done with its one electron? It's one valence electron, sorry. Sean, put that away. Pay attention, please. What has sodium done with its one electron? It's given it away. So therefore, sodium has a plus one charge, where chlorine has a negative one charge. These are full-blown charges. These are complete charges. These are partial charges. Make sure you know the difference between metal and non-metal. These are full charges. Sodium has given chlorine its electron. However, here, these are part of a charge, partial charges, because they're sharing. Okay. So when we talk about a dipole moment, we actually have some movement of the electrons closer to one atom than the other. Uh, let's see. Polarity. We can do an analogy. Actually, let me get my model here. I like to use an analogy, a tug of war analogy. Okay. If I look at, we'll say that this is methane, which is carbon in the middle and four hydrogens all around it. Okay. Carbon has the higher electronegative value, which is 2.5, and the hydrogen is 2.1. So if I look at this shared pair of electrons between the carbon and the hydrogen, who has the greater attraction for those shared pairs, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon. So what that means is the attraction or the dipole moment is toward the carbon. Now, what I mean by a tug-of-war analogy, that means that carbon is pulling on all of those electrons. If the carbon is pulling on all four of those electrons, will this move as a result of a tug-of-war analogy? In other words, let's say that they're all pulling. They're all pulling with the same amount of force. If this one pulls, that one pulls, that one pulls, and that one pulls, will the central atom move? No. It doesn't matter which way I turn it. Does anybody remember what the name of the shape is? Tetrahedral. That's good. You want to know that. Okay. So, no. This would mean that if they're all pulling with the same amount of force, the central atom does not move. This is my analogy. You're not going to find this in any chemistry book. So I'm going to use great English here. No move, nonpolar. So if the central atom does not move, this is a nonpolar compound. When we talk about nonpolar and polar, we're talking about things like this. These two things, oil and water, don't mix because we have a polar compound and a nonpolar compound. Okay, We'll talk about things that want to react with each other a little bit later on. Now, let's say that I'm looking at something else. Let's say that this is ammonia, NH3, where I have a nitrogen here, and these are three hydrogens. This is a lone pair of electrons. Using the same analogy, if these are all pulling or pushing with the same amount of force, will the central atom move? Yes, it'll move up. This is polar. This would be a polar compound. Okay. So if you're asked whether or not something's polar or not, draw it. We're going to get to draw it today, and then you have to memorize the names a little bit later on. But use that analogy. If there is a lone pair of electrons, most of the time it is what? Polar. polar. There are two exceptions. We'll talk about those a little bit later on. Okay. If, and here's a great one, if all the external atoms are the same, again, all the external atoms are the same, and there are no lone pairs on the central atom, this molecule is always what? Nonpolar. All of the external atoms are the same, no lone pairs, every single time. This is a nonpolar compound. Okay? Most of the time, when you have a lone pair, it is polar. There are two exceptions, which we'll talk about later. What if, and I don't have my model set with me, pretend that this top ball is red, which means that we have a different element here. Anytime you have different external atoms, I don't care if it's one or two or three, if you have different external atoms, it's always polar. Okay? Different external atoms, always polar. So here's your three most of the times. External total the outside atoms are the same, no lone pairs, always nonpolar. You have a lone pair of electrons most of the time, except for two exceptions, it is polar. Different external atoms. Polar. Okay. 
All right, and again, polar nonpolar deals with some topics that we'll talk about later on, whether something will dissolve or not in it. Okay. All right. And again, those are all things that we've hopefully discussed already. In general, Ken. All right, now, I know there are very difficult ways of teaching how to draw those structures. I'm not about being difficult. I'm always looking for the easy way of doing it. And I think on this sheet here, I have four basic steps. And I'm going to go through each of these four basic steps. And if you, the way that you were taught in general, Kim, if that's the way you want to keep doing it, that's fine. But the way I'm going to show you is probably the easiest way to write Lewis structures or draw Lewis structures. All right, so let's go through my rules. And again, I didn't get this from a textbook. I actually just developed this based on my own trial and error. Um, and this is for two-dimensional. So whenever we draw on the board or on paper, we're drawing two-dimensional. We'll, we'll worry about the three-dimensional a little bit later on. Okay. So today, Lewis structures, two-dimensional. Uh, determine first the total number of electrons for the molecule. Got to do that. You got to know how many electrons you're working with. Number two, determine which atom in the molecule will be centrally located. We'll talk about that as we do these examples. Number three, place the external atoms around the central atom and make sure they are satisfied first. Okay? All atoms except for hydrogen want eight electrons. All atoms, and again, we'll talk about non-metals with non-metals. All atoms around, as external atoms, want to have eight. So we've got to make sure that we follow the octet rule. And then the last step is, whatever electrons remain, we stick them on the central atom. Okay? So if we have two electrons remaining, place it on the central atom. If we don't have any external atoms remaining, okay, we used all of our electrons, then we need to adjust. Okay. So let's look on the back side here. Um, example number one it says determine if the molecule is nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. And I hope I have some ionics on here. I do. Good. And then it says draw the Lewis structure. Then determine if the molecule is polar or nonpolar. So we got a lot of things we're going to do on here. The first one here, PCl3. Okay. PCl3. Step one. We need to find out how many electrons we have. So when we talk about how many electrons, we're talking about how many valence electrons. We don't care about the total number of electrons. So when I look at phosphorus, how many valence electrons does phosphorus bring? And if you're not sure, you look on the periodic table. And if you're not sure again, we only care about those electrons in the s and p orbital for that row. Okay, so phosphorus is right here, element number 15. So how many valence electrons does phosphorus have? Five, right? We have two in the S, three in the P. Remember, the valence are the electrons that get the dance. The core, they don't get the dance, okay? So phosphorus brings five valence electrons. How many does each chlorine bring? Seven, and how many chlorines do we have? We have three. Okay, this is step one. We need to find out how many total electrons we have. So in this case, we have 21 plus 5 is 26. Okay, that's not hard. I hope you did that, in General Chem. Um, number two, or step two, which of these will be the central atom? Phosphorus or chlorine? Phosphorus. Any time you have a singleton, put it in the middle. Okay, put it in the middle. Now, who is always going to be placed in the middle. Does anybody remember? Carbon. Carbon. You see carbon or carbons in plural tense. Put carbon in the middle. Carbon <coughs> always goes in the middle. Always. Who never goes in the middle? Hydrogen. Hydrogen never ever goes in the middle. Why does hydrogen not go in the middle? Right, it can only have two electrons. So it brings one, but it can only have two. So the thing that we're looking at is the thing that we're putting in the middle needs to have an octet. Okay? All right, so we have our phosphorus in the middle. 
Uh, let's see here. And then number three, place the external atoms around. And I don't care where you place them. Okay? It, it doesn't matter. Just for now, if we have four or less <coughs> elements, put it in the quadrants. 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock. That's fine. When we get over four, then we'll adjust. Okay? And then number three says place the external atoms around the central atom. And be sure the external atoms have their eight. So we're going to satisfy the external atoms first. Give them their eight. Okay? I don't care which electrons are chlorines. I don't care which electrons are phosphorus. It doesn't matter. They're sharing. Okay? When you share, you're sharing. It's not mine. If I'm sharing, I can't say this is mine. It's ours. Think of it that way. All right, so I have, how many electrons do I have shown up here? 24. How many do I have to work with? 26. That's what step four says. Whatever's left, dump on the central atom. We're done. Okay. Now, here's one thing that you need to realize. If you, between the elements, you place a pair of electrons between, whether on accident or on purpose, they are being shared. Okay? I'll say that again. If you place electrons between elements on accident or on purpose, they are being shared. So if I said, uh, okay, I noticed that there isn't any down here. I put the other two electrons on the phosphorus. Okay? I meant for it to be with the phosphorus. Well, you're telling everybody that chlorine now has 10 electrons. Not possible. Okay? Not as an external atom. So again, whether it's on purpose or on accident, because we can. We can have what's called a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond here. And if you put them between, okay, you're, you're telling everybody that they're sharing. Now, is there such a thing as a quadruple bond? Never. Don't even think about it. Single, double, triple. That's as big as we get. No quadruples. All right. Um, okay, let's I think there were some other questions here. Is this a... What kind of bond do we have between the phosphorus and the chlorine here? So that right there. What is that? Is that ionic? It's covalent. What kind of covalent? Polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar? Polar? Why is it polar? Because they're different. These are different. They have different electronegative values. What are they? We don't care. They're different. So this is a polar covalent bond. So is these. What's that? Who's the same? Phosphorus and chlorine are the same? Again, the, this bond right here between the phosphorus and the chlorine. I'm sorry. What did I say? Okay, we're talking about something different here. I haven't even asked what the molecule is yet. I just asked what kind of bond. Okay, and, and again, I apologize. I didn't make up the naming whether this is a polar or nonpolar compound. But the bond between the, the phosphorus and the chlorine is a polar covalent bond. I didn't write that on there. This is a bond. In other words, anytime you're sharing electrons, that's the bond. Now, what kind of compound do we have? Is this a polar compound or a nonpolar compound? Polar? Polar? Nonpolar. Non -polar? I love to play poker with you guys. Here's what we have. Okay? You have three, and again, it doesn't look quite like that, but again, it's two dimensional. So I have a lone pair of electrons. And the chlorines are all pulling. Again, using my tug of war analogy here. Pull, pull, pull. Lone, never push or pull. So will the central atom move? Yes. Oh yeah. Move, it's polar. No move, nonpolar. This is a polar compound. If I place that in water, it will dissolve in water. Okay. If it were nonpolar and we had PCL4, like you said, then we did that's a bad example. If we had PCL4, then it would act like that in water. Okay. They don't want to mix. They don't want to be, they don't even want to be next to each other. If you look at that gross little layer between, it's all hate there. There's no love. They do not want to be there. All right. 
Did I answer all the questions on there? So we've got whether it's pork event, non pork event, ionic, Lewis drawn. Yep, we're good. All right. Next example C3H8. Does anybody remember what that's called? C3H8. C3H8. It's one of those hydrocarbons that you want to have memorized. Like graphite. Graphite? <coughs> Ooh, where'd that come from? Give you a hint. Some of you might have it outside your house in a little white cylinder or container. It's kind of a chubby cylinder underneath the grill. Propane, good. All right. <laughs> Uh, so first of all, step one, let's find out how many electrons, how many electrons does carbon bring? Each carbon? Four. Okay, so we have four valence electrons, and we have three carbons, so we'll multiply that by three. How many does hydrogen bring? One. Good. And we have eight of those, so what is that, 12 plus eight is 20? You like that? Are you impressed by that math? What's the math? 12 plus 8? Yeah. All right. I have more than one central atom. Who are my central atoms here, Ashley? Carbon. carbon. Always put carbon in the middle. Okay. That's step two. Step three, put the others around. Can I put a hydrogen between a carbon there? No. Don't do it. Don't even think about it. You're calling that a central atom. So we have to put the hydrogens around the horn, so to speak. Well, that's nice. That works out well. Okay. Satisfy the external atoms. So give hydrogen how many? Two. Two. And don't put them up here. That'd be bad. Why? Because you're leaving carbon out. Okay. So put them between. And how many electrons do I have shown so far? 16. So whatever's left? up on the central atoms in this case. Since the poor carbons don't have anything yet, put them in between. And I think we're done. So the carbons have the rate, the hydrogens each have two, which is what they want. And again, we want to make sure of a couple things. For any element other than hydrogen, it wants to have eight, but hydrogen wants to have two only. And it has to be between the central atom and itself. Then make sure that the central atom has at least eight. Say that again, make sure it has at least eight. I don't think we violate the octet rule today. We don't. But when we do, we'll talk about why. All right, so let's see. What kind of what kind of bond be, do we have between the carbon and the hydrogen? Polar covalent? Non polar? Polar covalent? Why polar covalent? Because they're They're different. These guys are different. So polar covalent, and again, bond. Now, Sean, just I'm sure you were you thought I was talking about this bond, right? Between the carbons. What kind of bond do we have there? Non-polar non covalent. Very good. So it is possible to have two types of bonds within the same compound, and that's fine. Okay. If you have different ones, identify them at least. Okay. Polar covalent bond because we have different non-metals. Non-polar covalent because they're the same. They're, these two carbons are sharing these electrons equally. The carbon and the hydrogen here are not sharing them equally. That's why it's polar covalent. All right. Is this a polar compound or a non-polar compound? Non-polar. Non-polar, why? Because it's all polar. Okay. What else? An easier way. Okay, and another one. Finish it off. Okay, but very good. All the external atoms are the same, and there's no lone pairs. Okay, make sure those two criteria. Because you could have all the same external atoms. That's what we had on the PCL3, except there was a lone pair. Go ahead, Taylor. I'm sorry. Do you want us to label all the bonds? No, just uh, label one of each. So in this case, this one is a polar covalent bond, and here. So I don't want you to, you don't need to do this. Okay, there's my non-polars. Here are my polars. That would be crazy. And I know there's probably teachers that want you to do that, but 
look how pretty that is by doing that. Remember, I have to grade that. So just identify one of those bonds. Uh, at this point, you would rewind the video to look at how it was before. All right, so this is a nonpolar compound. Good. All right. Let's look at the next one. Sodium chloride. Okay. How many valence electrons does sodium bring? What was that? <laughs> one valence electron. Very good, because it's in group 1A. And chlorine brings how many? Seven. Seven. So we have a total of eight electrons. What kind of compound do we have here? Before we go any further, ionic, because you have a metal. And what do ions want to do? Give away their electrons. So there is no central atom in ionic compounds. So if you had something like aluminum oxide where you have two aluminums and three oxygens, there's no central. However, there are a lot of walls, which we'll talk about here. All right, so sodium starts off with one valence electron, right? And what does it do with that one valence electron? It gives it away, so it's gone. Since sodium started with one electron and it now has no valence electrons, we have to put brackets around that element. Okay? The brackets mean two things. The first thing is it tells everybody that this thing that's in the brackets has a different number of electrons from that which it started with. Okay, sodium had one, it now has zero, and I'm talking valence. Second thing, it tells how many either came on the scene or left the scene. And how do I do that? Very good, I put a charge on there. Plus one means that it had one electron, dumped it. Okay? All right, so the brackets again mean two things. It has a different number of electrons from that which it started with, and how many left or came on. Chlorine had seven electrons. Sodium was so gracious and gave it one more. Okay? So since it has a different number of electrons from that which it started, and again, it's theirs. It's not being shared. We never put brackets around shared electrons. And how many electrons did chlorine pick up? One. So we give it a negative one charge. And these charges, no matter how many we have, better add up to zero. <coughs> At this point in the game. We'll, come, we'll have some compounds later on where we'll have some charges. But for now, everything, if it's an ion or an ionic compound, will have a charge of zero. Okay? All right, now let me ask you this. What kind of bond do, do we have between the sodium and the chlorine? Ionic. Very good. It's an ionic compound. We have an ionic bond. So the bond between is ionic. Is this polar or nonpolar as a compound? Polar or nonpolar? Now let, me, let me tell you this. Water is a polar compound. And all ionic compounds, to some degree, dissolve in water. Therefore, all ionic compounds are polar. Okay. So we'll just we'll put a blanket statement on there. Okay. All ionic compounds are polar. Polar compound. Okay. They don't have polar covalent bonds. They're a polar compound because they dissolve in water to some degree. Now at this point where we're talking about ionic compounds, they dissolve 100% or they dissociate 100%. Okay, we'll talk about the weirdos a little bit later on. All right, you guys liking this? I'll review, hopefully you're bored out of your mind at this point, right? Good. I don't want you to learn anything today. This is all review. The next one, nitrogen. Okay. All right. Uh, how many valence electrons does each nitrogen bring? Five. And since we have two of those, we have a total of ten that we're working with. Okay. Who's my central atom? There's two of them. However, it does help to make one of them your central atom and one of them your external atom. Because if you follow the way that I do it, 
satisfy the external atom first. In other words, give one of them eight. Okay? Give one of them eight. Satisfy the external atoms first. Now, how many electrons do I have shown so far? Eight. So put the others on the nitrogen. I don't care if you put it here, here, just don't put it there. Okay? Do not put it between the two nitrogens. Why? What if you decided, for whatever reason, again, whether it's on accident or on purpose, you put it between, they're sharing. Exactly. This nitrogen cannot have 10. Nitrogen can, nitrogen can never have 10. We'll talk about those that could have 10, but nitrogen can never have 10. Actually, the elements in the first row, okay, the carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the fluorine, can never have 10 electrons. Why? Here, before you answer that. However, the elements below, like phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine, as a central atom, they can have more than eight. Why can those have maybe 10 or 12 electrons as their central atom, but nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and carbon can only have eight? Does anybody remember? What do phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine have that carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine do not have? I'll give you a hint. It's right in the middle. D orbitals. They don't have any place to put extra electrons. However, the phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine do. That's why we can have more than an octet. All right, now this is what's cool. We said that the nitrogen on the right has eight electrons. How many electrons does the nitrogen on the left have? Four. Again, don't forget, whether it's on accident or on purpose, if it's between, they're being shared. So since this one has four electrons, this one has eight. We need to get this nitrogen to have eight as well. But we've already used all of our electrons. So here's a real neat saying. The one with eight <coughs> is the one that you're going to manipulate. Okay? The one with eight is the one you're going to manipulate. So what that means is I'm going to start swinging pairs. Take a pair. I don't care if it's from the top, the bottom, or the right. I don't care. Put it in the middle. <coughs> How many electrons does this nitrogen now have? Eight. Still has eight. How many does this one have? Six. Six. We're almost there. So swing another pair. <coughs> Everybody should have eight right now. Okay. Again, whether it's on accident or on purpose, if they're between, they are being shared. What kind of bond do I have between the two nitrogens? Nonpolar. Non covalent. covalent. Make sure you finish that. Okay. So nonpolar covalent. What kind of compound do I have? Nonpolar compound. Okay? And I would, I would get used to saying the whole thing to keep yourself out of trouble. I wouldn't just call the bond nonpolar. I wouldn't just call the compound nonpolar. To keep yourself out of trouble, say the whole thing. This is a nonpolar covalent bond, which means that they are sharing these electrons equally. equally. Thank you, Taylor. And this is a non-polar compound, which means that this will dissolve or not dissolve in water? It will not. Okay, it'll bubble right through. Good. Alrighty. Last one. HCN. What the heck? We've got three different elements. All right. Uh, let's get our number of electrons. So hydrogen has how many? Oh, on the nitrogen. Okay, I'll put it back in short. Hand. Does this have a dipole moment? No. No, very good. Because they're sharing those electrons equally, so there's no push or pull, if you use that type of word now. All right, so hydrogen brings one electron. Carbon, how many valence electrons? Four. Four. And nitrogen, five. five. So oh, we got another tenor. Okay. Who's my central atom? Carbon. Carbon, always. And then I don't care if you put the hydrogen over there or on top. You, you get to choose. This is your artistic creativity here. Give the external atoms what they want before we satisfy the central. So hydrogen gets two. Nitrogen gets Okay. So the external atoms are satisfied. They're happy. 
Is carbon happy? No. How many electrons does carbon have? Four. Very good. Two there and two there. So again, the one with eight is the one that we're going to start swinging around here. So what do we need to do? Swing pa two pairs over. So now how many does carbon have? Six. Two plus four. What? Carbon has the four plus the two. That's six electrons. So we need to swing another pair. Okay. All righty. What type of bond do I have between the carbon and the hydrogen? Oh, very good. You guys are good. Polar covalent bond. What kind of bond do we have between the carbon and the nitrogen? Polar covalent. Good. Okay. Is this a polar or non-polar compound? Why? Why is this polar? I'll agree with her on that. What's that? Okay, that and what else? The N still has, a, and has its own. Psh, we don't care about that. <laughs> different. Different external elements. Easy thing you got to remember. If the external atoms are different, polar. Don't even think twice. Okay. There's a lot of things that we could talk about. Yeah, the dipole moments actually go like this. The attraction between the carbons and the hydrogen push those electrons that way. Nitrogen has a greater attraction between the carbon and the hydrogen. Nitrogen, so they all push in that direction. Easier, they're different. External atoms makes it a polar compound. Okay. So for the homework tonight, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to draw the Lewis structure out um, and do show your valence electrons. That's a good habit to get into. It's a very good habit to get into. And then tell me what kind of bond you have between the atom, okay, at least one representative of each. And then tell me if you have a polar compound or a non-polar compound.